Shalom Chavim. We're, me and my wife are, are definitely been in a lot of studying, a lot of prayer, um, more so study, I have to be quite honest, than anything else as far as the Vatican series. And um, this message here is not part of the Vatican series. Tonight on um, Shabbat Live, as we were talking on there, I was really kind of disturbed because I could not think of how the Lord wanted me to speak uh, tonight on Shabbat Live. Um, but as I got into the program, and I prayed before going on, and I just asked the Lord, I said, God, I really, I've been studying this and studying that, and I don't know how to tie this together, that together as of yet, because I'm letting you lead me, and I'm still doing more research on different things. So I don't really want to get into the things going on in the Vatican series as much. Um, so I said, God, I just need your help. I don't know what to say. And as the Lord began to deal with me, just it seemed that the power of God come upon me. And yet the, the recording, we were having trouble, difficulties there. Um, and I felt in my heart a message that needed to be spoken for my own people, for the Jewish people. I felt like that there was a message of urgency, a message of warning, and a message of um, realization that was coming out. And I wanted to take and come now with you now and speak that message. Now, let me first warn those brothers and sisters that because I, I get precious people that love me, that they enjoy this ministry, and when they're following the ministry, if I get excited, if I get passionate about something, and I begin to get loud and raise my voice, it bothers them. So I, I need to warn you now, that's going to happen, no doubt, tonight. Uh, my voice is a little worn out from earlier, um, but when it comes to my own people... I'm very passionate about Israel and them recognizing who the Messiah is. You know, it would be like, for example, you have children, no doubt, and if you really love your children and your children are not behaving properly or something, especially if it's life-threatening, um, you know, if your child was about to be ran over by a car because it's a busy intersection and you're out together as a family shopping and you see um, little Jimmy or something wandering towards the intersection where he could easily get killed, you know, you're not going to calmly just say something because of your love and your compassion for that child. You're going to act quickly. You're going to speak loudly. You're going to do what it takes to get their attention and bring them back uh, to that point there. And that's, that's what I'm going through right now. So, as I speak tonight, I, I believe this will be a blessing for my, my Christian friends as well. But I'm, I need to say, I'll send this video to Rabbi Misrachi in New York. I'll send this video to Rabbi Tobia Singer. Uh, we're friends on Facebook. Uh, I will send this video to Rabbi Winston. And perhaps some other prominent rabbis as well. Let me just, let me share something with you, my brother, my rabbinical brethren, so we kind of understand what's going on. Um, we know a lot of the prophetic things that are happening in the world today, especially when we begin to look at Daniel in the book of Daniel. Um, and Daniel is listed as part of the writings of the Tanakh. I really feel that Daniel should have been considered one of the prophets, but neither here nor there. But let me just say something here. Let's take a quick look at this because it's, it's to me it's, it's vital that we recognize the the coming of Mashiach, Chaba'a, uh, Mashiach. In Daniel chapter 9, and I know guys We have looked at the Christian writings, the ministers, the theologians, and we have argued this point and argued this that point. This can't be Mashiach. Jesus could not have been Mashiach because 
he, he didn't fulfill Torah. He did not fill the, the, the prophets and the things that were said of him by the prophets. Um, and we argue the points. Probably the most noted points of all is when we look at the, um, the prophetic side of uh, the pro prophecies speaking about the peace that the king that his kingdom will bring to be a, key, a kingdom of peace and and prosperity um, and he shall rule the nations with a rod of iron things of this nature here these are things that we think of and we have looked at the Christian argument and we say it couldn't have been because these things were not fulfilled now I know we don't like hearing this because the Christian scholars know this as well, that in the Talmud it says that, that the Mashiach should come before the destruction of the second temple. And why? For good reason. In, the, in Daniel, in the prophet Daniel's writings, um, he says in chapter 9, um, which is Tet in the, uh, in the Tanakh, in verse uh, 24 in Chavdalet, 70 weeks are de decreed concerning thy people and concerning thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end to, uh, to sins and to atone for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophet. We know that the 70 weeks applies to Israel. But the thing is, is the final part of this is the bringing in everlasting righteousness to end our sins. Okay, our sins are not over yet. We're not offering the sacrifices as it was in the time of the temple. So, what is atoning for our sins? Now, we know that Scripture says that, you know, that He prefers sincere love over the burnt offerings and sacrifice. And, and so we kind of lean to this. But the thing is, is we still, there must be a blood atonement for sin. It's, it's what... It's what is in the prophecy. It's what's in the Torah. We have this goat and the scapegoat. The sacrificial goat, which was the lamb that was to be offered once a year for the sins of the children of Israel. And the scapegoat would have our sins confessed upon him. And a strong man would take him to the wilderness and loose him. And any of you rabbis that have ever taken the time to listen to the teachings that I do on this, as I say, I believe this comes, that God gave this law as a, as a direct look at the story of Yosef. When God was dealing with Yosef and his brethren of the, of the patriarchs, they, Joseph was a dreamer. And so they take, not Benjamin, see, Benjamin was not involved in this, but they take and his other brothers, they take, the ten brothers, they take, they throw him in a ditch. They say, let's see what happens to his dreams now. You don't think that 2,000 years ago that when this man by the name of Jesus of Nazareth was walking the shores of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, that our forefathers who were the priests of that day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, didn't have the same thought in their mind? We'll have him committed to the Romans and they will kill him and we'll see what, what comes of his prophecies now. Brother, sister, the, 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 it's being repeated. So what happened? Joseph is thrown into the ditch. He's sold for 28 pieces of silver. And we know the story. He goes down to, to Egypt. He's falsely accused. And, and, and we're, we're used to the Christian theologians that come around and, 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 they, and they do all these things about, uh, you know, the types of Jesus and stuff, you know, and how the Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver and he was, you know, he was dead, he, he was buried and he raised back up to the, to the right hand of God and we say that Joseph was the right hand of Pharaoh. Typical story, right? But what about those goats? Joseph is a type of the, the scapegoat. When, why? When his brethren laid their hands upon him and they threw him in the ditch. That is Israel laying their hands upon him. 
They do confess their sins later, but they lay their hands on him and they throw him in a ditch and then he's taken far from the presence of their father, Yaakov. Where Jacob cannot see them any longer. He has no idea whatever happened to Joseph. And Joseph bears in his body the sins and the iniquities of his brethren. All by Benjamin. And then where is the sacrificial goat? When they take the coat of long sleeves, and they take and they sacrifice the kid of the flock, and they put the blood upon the, on his coat, and they take it back to his father, and they say to his father, they said, you know, uh, tell us, is this your son's coat or no? Identify for us. That's what we did. So the thing is, is that, you know, God in his own righteous judgment had a right to destroy those ten tribes and wipe them off the face of the earth, never to be in remembrance again. Had he not taken the very goat that they sacrificed and applied it to their sin, God would have had to wipe out ten of our tribes for the sins that they did against Joseph. Now you might argue, well, they had time to repent. That's it. There you go. He gave space time for us to repent. And in fact, when later in life, when the famine strikes, Daniel's 70th week, isn't it odd how Daniel has a 70th week? And we look at that Daniel's 70th week, there's going to be a covenant to be signed. We're going to read it here in just a moment. But Joseph prophesies while he's in bondage that there is a seven-year famine coming. And it's during that time of famine that Joseph ends up revealing himself to his brethren. But it's only after they go through a lot of trials and a lot of testings. The first two years, the famine, and everyone is starving, and they're forced to go to Egypt to buy food. Isn't it funny how that the Gentiles seem to have your food stored up? Yes. What is God trying to show us from the story of Joseph? The scripture plainly tells us because we would not give our hearts fully to him, he would be sought after those that did not seek him. He would go to the Goim, and he has gone to the Goim. Even Benjamin Netanyahu, our Prime Minister, the King of Israel, who is anointed by Mike Evans, anointed by a Christian, prophesied over that he would be Prime Minister over Israel, not once but twice. Is God not prophesying in Israel? Sure, he's prophesying in Israel. Now, I know that Hashem is with our people. We would not be in our homeland if it wasn't for Hashem being with our people today. So, Joseph bears in his body the sins, but God takes the blood of the goat that was sacrificed and poured on his coat and it was taken to his father and God applied that blood for the sacrifice for the sins of his brethren. Otherwise, God would have taken their lives. Now, when they do come down, we find in the story, Benjamin, and just to make the story kind of quick, the first time they realize their money is back in their sack. They're on their way to the hotel, they're on their way back, they stop at the hotel, they find the money in the sack, they begin to get fearful. Why? Because they recognize what they had done to their brother, and they feel like that their sins are coming back to find them out. Exactly. Where was Jesus, Yeshua, where was he first rejected? He was rejected at the hotel when he was in the womb of his mother and there was no room found in the inn. That's where he was first rejected. And then the second time we see in the story here, just quickly fast forward in this because I want to get to a, a lot deeper subject for you. When all the brothers come down, and Joseph finally is going to reveal himself to his brethren. When is he going to reveal himself to his brethren? During the famine. During Daniel's 70th week. He 
He doesn't reveal quite yet, but what does he do? He makes a feast for them at the midday. They come, they're fearful. They remembered the sins that they did to Joseph. They have no idea that this is Joseph that's blessing them, though. Just as we do not seem to realize today in Israel and around the world, the Jewish people are not recognizing that it is Yeshua that is pouring the blessings upon us. And if you don't get it right now, I understand why. It is okay. I'm saying this, though, for you to think about it. But when they call him in for the dinner, Notice that Benjamin is blessed far greater than all of his brothers. More food, more everything. Just as Israel today, we are far blessed more with the riches of the economy and a good living far greater than any of the times in our past. But when he loads our sacks down with the money, grain, he gives us the provision for our fathers and he takes his cup and he puts him Benjamin's back. And of course, we know the story. The servant overtakes him and he says, why have you done evil to my master? And Benjamin was innocent. But the whole point of the story is, is God wants us to recognize, although we as Jews today were not there 2,000 years ago when the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the other Jews that were there that were against Jesus as being Moshiach, and we're willing to condemn him, he's trying to get our attention to realize, yes, we were not there, but the cup is in our bag, just as it was in Benjamin's bag. Benjamin was not responsible, but God held him responsible for what he would do. And then, of course, we know there was a story. They come back, and then, then, when they're willing to accept responsibility, then Joseph reveals himself to them. Now, I say this to you, my brethren. They never recognized Joseph of their own accord. They never recognized Joseph of their own rabbinical teachings, their own rabbinical scholars, or anything else. It takes Joseph himself to get them to recognize who he is. But it's kind of ironic that his servant gives away a little bit to him. He comforts them a little bit. But it takes yourself to reveal it. Now, I say this now. I'm building up this platform for you because why? In Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, okay, it's, it, this, is, this is supposed to happen in the 70 weeks that applied to our people, all right? Then we find them from the uh, going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem until an anointed prince shall be seven weeks and then 62 weeks and it shall be built again with the squares and a moat but in a troubled time, okay? What do we have here? Excuse me, Lahashiv. Excuse me. Lava Lebanot, Jerusalem, Ad Moshiach Nagi, Shavaim Shiva, Veshvaim Shashim, Veshnaim. Ushnaim, excuse me. Tashuv. Okay? So we have that. We see that the Messiah, Moshiach, Moshiach Nagi, an anointed prince, was to come. And he tell, they tell the time and everything, how long that time would be. And that the squares in the moat would be laid, and it would be in a troubled time. And we know that when the second temple, you know, the second temple was built, it was during a troubled time and everything. But after 62 weeks, an anointed one will be cut off. After the 62 weeks, So there's one week left. And none will be left of him. Moshiach would be cut off. It's not just an anointed one. It's Moshiach. Ve'achare ha'shavi'im shashim ve'shnaim ve'ikarat Moshiach ve'ein lo. This is why the Talmud records that the Messiah would, something would happen to him before the destruction of the second temple. But watch what happens next. And none will be left to him. And the people of a prince, 
There's no Mashiach recorded in this verse. Just Nagid. Nagid alone is recorded here. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. This is why we know that Mashiach would be cut off before the destruction of the second temple. Because it says after that Mashiach is cut off, there's a people coming that are going to destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now Titus, the Roman general, did just exactly that. The, 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 over in Rome, they have the, the, the thing called the Ark of Titus. And the Catholic Church boasts about the destruction of the Second Temple. And they hail Titus as the great warrior of Rome. But there's a prince that shall come. A Nagid. In Nagid Haba, a prince shall come. And he's going to be of those people, but he's not going to be Mashiach. And when does he come? It clearly tells us right here. And his end shall be with a flood. And the end of the war, desolations are decreed. My brother and sister, this, this, this is at the final hour. This is, this is during that last week. This is during, as Joseph seen, a seven-year famine. The Christians teach in the writings from John, who was a Jew, by the way, that there is a tribulation period coming, coming upon the earth. Now, the Christians know it's seven years because we have it right here in Daniel. They're taking Daniel's writings for this. But yet they have two, three and a half year periods written in Revelation. One speaks about two, uh, two uh, witnesses coming that, that warn Israel of what's going on and tell Israel who Mashiach is. And it's not against our teachings because they believe that Eliyahu, Elijah, is one of those witnesses. And we know, according to Malachi, the prophet, that he said that Elijah, Elijah, Elijah shall come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord and he shall restore everything. Israel believing who Mashiach is and the word of God being restored is everything being restored. Us being a nation is restoring everything. Us being delivered. Us, the righteousness of God's word being fulfilled. The delivery of the iniquities and the sins. All of everything that's written here in Daniel's prophecy is all things are restored. So this is when Eliyahu comes. This is when Elijah comes. But don't we know also from, from, the, from Moses' own words, Moshe says in Shemot, in Exodus, in, in uh, chapter 15, I will sing unto the Lord. He's gotten victory over the haughty or over the horse and over his rider. And Rashi, the great Torah commentator, he comments on this and he says, undoubtedly, Moshe must return and it undoubtedly be in the messianic age. Then what about Zechariah when he speaks to the two anointed ones? To stand before the altar or, or, or on each side of the of, of, of the, the, the two olive, branch, uh, olive branches. I mean, everything is hidden right there, right now. I, I'm getting to this because there's something very, very serious I want you to see here. Now, so we see that the prince that's going to come is of the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. Hello, Rome. Now, we argue that when Jesus was here, he didn't fulfill the word. We, we never had peace. The peace didn't come. And, and, and please, don't go on this idea, kill me in a sacrifice, circumcision was a blemish. Oh my God. How foolish can rabbis get when they start saying stupid stuff like that? Abraham himself, when he was willing to offer his only son, God commands him to take his son and offer him as a sacrifice. You don't think God wasn't looking as a possibility to offer a son as a sacrifice? Sure he was. It seems barbaric today. But God wasn't speaking about it in a way that we would think of. But Abraham was willing, so he takes Yitzhak and he takes him up there and he puts him on an altar. He binds his hands. Yitzhak never complains. 
It is prophetic because why? God says through Abraham, when, as it says, Father, behold the wood, behold the fire, behold everything is here, the altar, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham's, God will provide for himself a sacrifice. He wasn't talking about bullocks. Abraham prophetically said, God will provide for himself a sacrifice. And he wasn't talking about the bullet caught in the thicket. If anything, the bullet in the thicket should have showed you that when the crown of thorns was placed on Yeshua's head, he was caught in the thicket. Not only does it show you that he's caught in the thicket, how did God come to Moses in the in the Sinai in the burning bush, the thorn bush that was on fire and consumed, and it was God, it was Hashem that was speaking to, to Moses from that Shekinah, from the light there in the bush. And when he spoke to Moses, God was in a thorn bush. When he spoke to Abraham, he showed that the sacrifice would be in a thorn bush. And when Yeshua came, crown him with a thorn bush. It was God himself in that bush. But he was veiled by a human body. But Abraham tells us that because he said, the Lord thy God will provide for himself a sacrifice. In other words, the sacrifice that Hashem was going to provide was going to be a sacrifice for him. For what? For himself to live in. Now maybe we can get this. Now maybe we can move on a little bit. Now, all right, let me share with you something else. Yeshayahu, Isaiah, chapter 61. Oh, yeah, we need to do Isaiah 61. Um, and uh, don't, don't get offended as we go to Isaiah, Yeshayahu, Shishim, uh, well, in 61. English numbers, that's not right. Okay. Samak Aleph. Uh, Adonai Hashem Ale Ya'on. The Spirit, excuse me, oh, sorry. Ruach Adonai Hashem Ale, uh, uh, ale Ya'on. The Spirit of Hashem. God Himself is upon me. He wasn't talking about just something was anointing his flesh. He was talking about what was inside of him. The ace Chaim that was in the Garden of Eden was upon him. The reason why he uses the word Al is because when we read about Moses, Moses says that Hashem was Al Hatsua upon the rock. It was a prophecy to show how the God himself would be upon the life-giving waters that would restore eternal life back to our people the way we needed to know to get back to Eis Chaim. And if you've not seen the teaching I do that, the Eis Chaim, what is the Eis Chaim? You know what it is, it's the tree of life. Chaim, what is Chaim? It is Hashem's own life in a plural form and he mishmar Chaim into Adam. Breathe that spirit of God's life into Adam in a plural form. Because why? Adam and Eve are both inside of that human body. When he separates Eve, how many of the Chabad organization, my brethren, that I'm a part of, how many of us do not know and it is taught there that when God made Eve, he taken down the side of Adam, not a rib. Our, the Chabad organization does not believe that it's a rib, but believes that God taken half of Adam and made Eve. But he says, mean ish, from the fire of Hashem that was in Adam, he made Isha, which was the feminine form of the fire of Hashem. Yes, Chaim. What did Yeshua do when he breathed on his apostles after the resurrection that he had and everything? He breathed on them and says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. He breathed upon them. Why? He's showing the Jewish people that he was the one in the Garden of Eden that breathed upon the nostrils of Adam, the life 
that went inside of him. And notice, Eve never had to have her nostrils breathed into because she received the Holy Ghost from her mother's womb. Do you wonder why then John the Baptist was fulfilled with the Holy Ghost when he come out of his mother's womb? Why? Typing Eve, the bride of Mashiach, was being typed through Adam's wife. No wonder why Yeshua had to lay his life down in order to bring forth that life as a sacrifice. The whole reason was, my brethren, was because Adam had to lay his life down in order to bring forth his wife. God put him into a deep sleep. And any of you guys know, when we use the word coma in Hebrew to put someone in a coma, that's what he did with Adam. He put him in a comatose state. Why? Because he had to open up his side and he had to bring forth his wife. And somebody recently wrote me and they said, you said there was blood that come from Adam's side when he did this. Do you think that this surgery is bloodless? If, if it was bloodless and it had to have been painless, and if it was painless and he didn't need to put him into a deep sleep, wake up. And I know that's not my Jewish brother. That's, that's the carnality. Uh, uh, God forgive me. I, I don't want to hurt feelings. So anyway, so he, he takes and he breathes on his apostles and he says, receive you the Holy Ghost, showing them that he was that tree of life. No wonder why John, in the book of John, uh, in his epistle, he writes, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. What was in the beginning? The Bible says right there, the, was the Word. What was the first Word that God spoke? Be'yomer Elohim, Yahiyod. And he said he was the light of man. And God said, let there be light. God was making himself tangible so that he could fellowship with us. He was making himself more than just tangible. He was making himself so that he could impart eternal life not only to Adam and to Eve, but to all of our children that were going to be born after that. But God, he'd given the commandment, repopulate and replenish the earth to Adam and Eve. But when sin came, that tree of life, the Eis Chaim, had been moved out of the way. Now Adam and Eve had eternal life. A sacrifice was offered for their sins because God put coats on them in order to cover their sin and the blood was accepted as an atonement for their sin. But their children would never receive the Holy Ghost unless God brought a sacrifice like Adam that was carrying eight Chaim inside of him. And you wonder why he says to the woman at the well, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, you would ask me for a drink of water and I would give you water that you don't have to come back here no more. He was showing her what God did with Moses at the rock when he smote that rock. Not the second time when he said, you rebels must we bring forth water from this rock and Moses glorifies himself because Mashiach was to be smitten once. So he smites it. God commands him, take the elders of Israel, go out, smite the rock that it bring forth its waters. And what was the argument about? The whole argument that brought all this on it wasn't even so much the thirsting, which they were thirsting. See, God let them get thirsty so that they would need, so they would know what they had need of, which was eternal life. God was trying to show our forefathers that we have need of his life and without his life, we thirst again. He was trying to show us that the day would come that the high priest of Israel along with the elders would come out and would see the rock and to them it would just be a stone. A stone of no life. And that we would smite this stone and we would judge this stone. And the question that would be asked as part of the judgment is, is God among us or not? Christian friends, I'm not talking about this person of God or that person of God. The argument was, was Hashem, the yod heh vav -Hey, was he among us or not? 
And because of the argument, and because of the questioning whether or not God was there or not, when Moses, God had used Moses to show him whether he was there, God takes, has Moses go and judge this rock that seemed like nothing and smite the rock as a sign of what Israel would do to Mashiach when he would come. And when he was smitten, it took the smiting of the rock to bring forth the water to prove that indeed it was Hashem. And that's what happened 2,000 years ago. When Yeshua came, he was smitten. And when he was smitten, when the Roman, it wasn't the Jews that did that, it was the Romans, they stabbed him in his side with that spear and ripped his side open. And blood for the sacrifice came forth and water showing like he said to the Samaritan woman if you knew who it was that was speaking to you you would ask me for a drink of water he was showing that he was the waters of life he was the Eitz Chaim in him what he was the way he was the truth and he was the life and no man gets there unless they go that way so we know what the argument was. Now, I say this all because I'm trying to bring you to a point. What is happening in our country right now? When Yeshua come, this was another argument. It's even written in the, in the Bible. We thought that this Jesus was going to rescue us from the Roman occupation. Do you guys not see my rabbinical brethren? both in Israel and around the world, do you not see history repeating itself? Just like in the time of the Maccabees? Israel got fearful. Felt like we couldn't really do it alone. Every nation was coming against us. And so Israel runs to the Greeks. What would be considered part of Rome today as well? And made an alliance with them thinking that it was going to be for their safety and protection. And what do they do? They come down in there and they take over Israel. They desecrate our temple. They turned on our people. And if you tried to keep the commandments of God, you were murdered for it. And here we are, our people are backed up in a corner. The whole world is turning against us. Seemed like the United States was our only ally, and now they have a Muslim leader, and so they turn against us as well. And so what are we doing? Running to Rome, the only peacemaker, Shimon Perez says, it's the only peacemaker in the world, is the Pope, Pope Wonderful, Pope Pontius Pilate, Pope Romanos, Pope... Uh, Francis, whatever you want to call him. Shimon Perez. The Christian Bible speaks in the book of Revelation and he says, I have one thing against you because you suffer that woman Jezebel. And that's not talking about the Jews. That, my friend, is talking to you Protestant Christians that were part of the Reformation, your churches were part of the Reformation. And in modern days, your people, your great evangelists of the days, the Billy Grahams, the, the uh, Smith Wigglesworth, well, no, Smith Wigglesworth didn't live till now, uh, or Roberts, all these great men, Paul Crouch, different men that have lived to the day that we're living in now. Not Billy Sunday either. You can't even count Billy Sunday in this because Billy Sunday didn't live to this day. But these great evangelists that have lived till now, that once were true Protestants and knew that the Vatican was the Antichrist spirit. But as time went on, you begin to suffer that woman Jezebel. Oh yeah, that plainly says in the Bible that she's a whore. It says it in the Tanakh as well. And I'm going to tell you that in just a moment. You suffered that woman Jezebel. And that's the one thing God had against these early evangelists. This is why we see Billy Graham fixing the leaf. Like Lot. It vexed his righteous soul daily. 
but he wouldn't speak against it. Okay, so we've allowed Rome to come back in. And then we want to condemn Jesus when he was here. We said he, did, he didn't finish anything. Let me tell you something. When Yeshua was here, he got up and he said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Okay, I'll read it to you in English. He has anointed me to announce good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound. He then said to proclaim an acceptable year of the Lord and a day, excuse me, acceptable year of the Lord. He took right there in a comma in the sentence and he closed the scroll and he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing. You don't think he didn't know that he was fixing to be cut off according to Daniel's prophecies? Sure he did. Sure he knew exactly what was going to happen. That's exactly why. When he wept over Jerusalem, he said, Jerusalem, in Matthew chapter 23, Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. So your house is left to you desolate until you say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of of the Lord. Now, let me just share with you something on that particular verse. That is taken from Psalm 118.26 is where that's taken from. And I, I just really Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. You know what's sad? For my Christian friends, when you quote Yeshua in the King James, you didn't capitalize all that. I don't think. Let me just double check. Because see, the thing is, it's, that's, that is Hashem's name. No, you don't. That's funny, you don't. You just say, blessed he's come in the name of the Lord as if it's a second person or something like that. But you're quoting from Psalm 118, verse 26. And that is, blessed he that comes in the name of Hashem. No wonder why the prophet Jeremiah says that his name shall be called Yehovah Sitkanu. Hashem is our righteousness. And believe me, that is not a compounded name. And that is speaking of Mashiach. I'm going to prove to you. I'm going to show you scriptures, my Christian friends, you've never seen before or never. Maybe you didn't. You saw it, but you didn't catch what it is about this right here. So he says there that your house is left to you desolate until you say this. Now we're back in the homeland. What is happening? Why is the Vatican taking control of Jerusalem right now? Why are they doing this covenant with Israel and dividing the land right now. Why? God is resetting the stage the way it was when this man Jesus of Nazareth left this earth. He is resetting it up again and the Romans are once again getting in control just as they did back 2,000 years ago when the Maccabee revolt came in. Now the Maccabee revolt, by the way, brothers, represents what we're going to do to all these nations because according, according to, uh, oh gosh, what, what word is that? Uh, Micah's prophecy, he says, turn your plowshares into swords and stuff and fight. Yeah, once you recognize who Mashiach is, then we'll be willing to fight. Yes, sir. But anyway, what happens here? All right, now. These Roman worthless good for nothing people come in and they took over. The Greeks came in in the days of the, before the Maccabees decided to revolt and they took over and they just began to destroy everything in their way. Every law we had was destroyed. Every custom we had was destroyed. And they did it. They made it look like they were coming to be our friends only to turn on us. Now, okay. So the stage is being set just like it was when Yeshua, when Yeshua arrived, this mess was already there. When he comes back, this mess will already be there. He's coming back to deliver us, 
because you said he didn't deliver us and set up peace back then. Well, he plainly shows us he wasn't supposed to deliver us in. He showed that he had to be cut off. He knew Daniel's prophecy. But he knows he is coming back, my brother. Let's get, let's get ready for this one. Now, you, now you're fixing to find out what the Word of God says. In Ezekiel chapter 35, I am the Lord. Now we're going to go down here. The word of the Lord came to me and said, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it and say it. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee and I will stretch out my hand against thee and I will make thee a total blight. I will lay thy cities waste and thou shalt be desolate and thou shalt know that I am the Lord because thou hast had a perpetual hatred and hast hurled the children of Israel to the power of the sword and to the time of their calamity and in the time of their final punishment. Wow. That's incredible. Do you not realize that Ezekiel speaks of our final punishment? Do you think we got scattered? I mean, honestly, Rabbi Singer, Rabbi Winston, Rabbi Mizrahi, do you honestly think that our people were scattered to all the world in 70 AD because we did something righteous? No time in God's word have our people ever been scattered except for sins. And don't think just because we're regathered again that, that our transgression is finished and our iniquity is finished. It's not finished. If it was finished, we would already be in a millennial reign with God. So something's not made right yet. And I know we're looking at the temple to be restored. Uh, that, that's the thought. The temple gets restored. That's what we're waiting for. Okay. He says right here, the, so, the, 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 uh, God is angry with Mount Seir because why? Thou hast had a hatred and hast hurled the children of Israel to the power of the sword. Did not the Vatican, were they not the ones that have, the Spanish Inquisition since then, uh, Mussolini, the pogroms, uh, Stalin, every hatred towards the Jews, the Vatican has been behind it. Sure they have. But notice the next part of the sentence. In the time of their calamity, in the time of their final punishment. I don't care if we like it or not. We have to admit this. My own mother's family came from Europe illegally to the United States to escape perse persecution that was going on in, in, in Europe at the turn of the century. This was before Hitler even got into power. And my grandfather tells me the story how that they were under the persecution and they fled Europe to get out of Germany and they were ship merchants and they jumped off the ship, came to the United States illegally. And as a result, part of the family was spared. But when the Holocaust came, the Coleman family, the Heinrich family, in the Coleman family, thousands perished in the Holocaust. In the Heinrich family, there's 400 Yad Vashem records the Heinrich family. We know this is our final punishment. Whether we want to admit it or not, it's still the final punishment. Because why? Israel returned home. Then the scripture where it speaks of Judah and Ephraim would once again be back together in their homeland. And there would no longer be two nations, but they would be one. Look at the work that Michael Frund is doing with Shri Israel, IsraelReturns.org. We're IsraelReturns.com. He's IsraelReturns.org, bringing back the lost tribes of Israel. Ever since the Holocaust, the final punishment in the Vatican, I show you the, the, the photos of, of, of the covenants that were signed between the Vatican and the Nazi party. Not to say there weren't many good Catholic people, individuals, that rescued Jews. There were. But that ungodly, filthy, prostitute system that sent our people to the death chambers, the gas chambers, and everything else 
you're allowing a covenant to be made with them. Oh, Palestinians, oh, I'm sorry. Let me show you what it's all about, though, okay? Let's look at it. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I will, uh, I will prepare thee to blood. That's what he's going to do to the Vatican for what they did to us. And blood shall pursue thee. Surely thou hast hated thine own blood. What blood is he talking about? They claim Jesus to be their Messiah, that he gave their, his blood for them. As he gave his blood for and he did. He gave his blood for the entire world. I agree with that. And any Catholic that wants to come out and recognize that Jesus Christ truly is the Messiah and to believe upon him and what he did, God will save that soul. But he said, you hated your own blood. See, Jesus was a Jew. And so they even hated us because he was Jewish by birth. His mother was a Jew. Therefore, blood shall pursue thee. Thus I will make Mount Sierra most desolate and cut off from it all whom come and go. And you know why it says come and go? Because every single diplomat, every delegation, every king, every monarch, every, every president, every prime minister, every one of you go into the Vatican and you're coming and going, all the dignitaries of the world, and you bow down to the Pope. You bow down to the Pope. You greet him. Oh, Shimon Perez says he's the only guy that can bring peace to the region. Uh, 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 the Syrian king recently sends a, sends a letter to the Pope and everything. This is what we'll, we'll do in order to be able to make peace. Well, what's he sending to the Pope for? Who are you warring against? The Pope? Well, the Pope calls a shot, so does he. Mahmoud Abbas goes to the Pope. Uh, Ariel Sharon went to the Pope. Uh, uh, Shimon Perez goes to the Pope. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu goes to the Pope. Uh, Barack Obama goes to the Pope. Uh, Joe Biden goes to the Pope. Uh, even Iran's uh, diplomat goes to the Pope and brings his credentials, <laughs> has to bring papers to prove who he is. He goes to the Pope. Everybody keeps going to the Pope. I wonder why. The whole world comes in a huge party when the Pope... Uh, um, Pope Francis gets elected as, as, the, as the new Pope. The world just comes and they bow. Even tribal nations are coming to the Pope for God's sake and bowing down to the Pope. They come and they go. And thy hills and thy valleys and all the water courses shall they fall and the slain with the sword and I will make thee a perpetual desolations and thy city shall not have restoration. They'll never be built again. And you shall know that I am the Lord, that is Hashem, because thou hast said, these two nations and these two countries shall be mine. Now, the funny thing is, everything's talking about Israel. And now, Ezekiel talks about these two nations and these two countries. He prophesied of this two-state solution. Wake up, rabbinical brethren. Wake up, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Wake up, people. Of Israel, wake up. Even you Palestinian people recognize Yeshua to be your Mashiach as well. Wow, there is time for you. Recognize him. Like Wali Shabbat. Recognize him. This is an hour for you, and it's a slim hour for you to recognize him. These two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess it Watch this. Though the Lord was there. Again, all capitals. That means it's Hashem. That's yod Hey vav Hey. The Lord was there. Now, a lot of people probably say, yeah, you know, Hashem was there in spirit. No, 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 no. This wasn't the spirit of God, the Shekinah glory that come down. He's saying God himself was there. Now, Remember when I said to you, it says here in their final punishment? Let's look at Hosea. And I'm going to close now. We're going to look at Hosea's prophecy. It's almost been an hour. I'm sorry to keep you so long. Hosea chapter 5, verse 15. Let me back up maybe verse 14 here. For I will be to Ephraim as a lion, as a young lion to the house of Judah. My brother, sister, that's judgment. That's what's been happening to us for almost 2,000 years. I even I will tear and go away. 
I will take away and there shall be none to deliver. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me. Even to my Christian friends, I beg you to really consider what those words are right there. Remember what Yeshua said, Jesus, when he stood over Jerusalem? How often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. Your house is left to you desolate until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of Hashem. He bore the divine name of God. That's why Jeremiah wrote of him and said, his name will be called Hashem Sitkanu, Yahweh Sitkanu, Hashem our righteousness. It's not a compounded word like Yeshua is either. And God, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem and said, I, I would have hovered you as a hen would have brood. But you would not. I leave your house desolate until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now that's a rebuke to the Vatican because in their desolation, God promises to restore them. That's a prophecy. By the way, Rabbi Tobias Singer, Rabbi Misrachi, that was a prophecy made by Yeshua that they would be restored. Yes, he did prophesy. And we are back as a nation. And then what does God say here? I will take away and there shall be none to deliver. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Jesus' exact words. Until you say, blessed is he that comes, your house is desolate. Until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of Hashem. And God is testifying right here that he was there. He was among us. When all this was going on, when this judgment is going to come down on both the house of Israel and the house of Judah, that he was there. If he was there, where was he then? He was in this man called Yeshua, called Jesus of Nazareth. So Jesus of Nazareth was. And my brother, forgive me. It was Yahweh. I know that's not the right way to say his name because that's one thing we're looking for. When God sends those two witnesses, they will know that name. They will know it. My wife brought out a good point I just mentioned to you too real quick. Beautiful revelation she had. She said, you know when Yeshua says in Matthew 24, talking about Jesus, he says in there, Many false Christs will come in my name, but believe them not. She said, I believe that was a dynasty of popes down through the ages. More than 200. No wonder. Yeah, many, many. Why? Why did she say that? It's beautiful. She even, she knew exactly the revelation God had given her. She says, because they're all considered a substitute for Christ. They're all the vicar of Christ. Every pope is a substitute for Jesus Christ. The word antichrist means instead of or replacement of Christ. Great God. Let me continue on with this, though. And he says, come, let us return to the Lord. Notice he did say, in their affliction, they will seek me. Just like Ezekiel, that final punishment. Our people begin to seek him. And I will agree, the rabbis of today are really seeking God. And Christian friends, let me tell you something. Do not condemn the Jewish people, the Hasidic Jews, the, the Orthodox Jews, when they, you know, you get upset with them because they spit on you, you should watch Ian McCormick's testimony when God brought this man back from life when he'd been dead for over 15 minutes in a hospital, laying in a morgue, and a guy cutting on his foot to bleed him out. I, I assume it was for bleeding him out. My apology if that's not right, Brother Ian. Let me tell you something. This man was an was 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 um, Ian was an atheist, but the mercy of God, he wanted vengeance for the people that did him wrong. But God asked him, "Will you forgive that man? They wouldn't take you to the hospital when you were dying. Forgive these Jewish people." You know when Jesus 
He gives that commandment. He talks about that. If you don't forgive those that trespass against you, neither will I forgive you. That applies to the Jewish people. I mean, as far as that, that, when the Jewish people do evil to you, you must forgive them. Because they can't help it. If a blind man runs you over or runs into you and knocks you down in the store walking, do you get up and beat him up? No, you recognize he's blind, he can't see. You forgive him. He can't help it. But what does God say here? In their affliction they will seek me, saying, Come, let us return to the Lord. For he has torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up after two days. He will revive us in the third day and we will raise up, he will raise us up and we shall live in his presence. That was three, that's God's dealing with thousands of years at that time. In the third day, it's been 2,700 and some odd years since then. We're well in the third day. Israel's back in our homeland. It's time for our people to recognize who the Mashiach is. My Jewish brother, I love you. With my whole heart, I love you. And if you don't get what I'm saying to you now, you will, son. Yeshua was not uh, some part of a Godhead of multiple gods. And many good Trinitarians don't believe like that in no way. They believe that it was God manifested in the human body. That's who he was. He was Hashem. If you're listening to this video now, and you're Jewish, Christian, whatever you might be, if you just happen to have stumbled onto this video, I adjure you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ, give your life to him now. If you're Jewish and you've not returned to the homeland, give your life to him now. It's not hard. Just simply repent of your sins and ask him to forgive you. Ask him to open your eyes and to recognize who he really is. Ask him for that mercy. If you're sincere from your heart, he's obligated to reveal himself to you. I adjure you. God bless you.